Welcome to the sixth episode of Kabbalistic Mystic, the podcast for the Western seeker, where we explore the tree of life and the ancient Hebrew wisdom as a map for psycho-spiritual development and self-realization. I'm your host, Avadya Batat. Last week, we spoke about the concept of androgyny as the essence of our true nature and human consciousness. We spoke of the fact that we all have a hidden masculine or hidden feminine within, and it's our job as seekers to get to know and incorporate this polarizing part within us into our personality as a part of our psycho-spiritual journey. Now in this episode, the androgynous you part two, we'll talk about how this androgynous nature of ours manifests in our day-to-day -day lives when it comes to our mental, emotional, and physical behavior. Let's begin. The tree of life shows us ten emanations or qualities of the Creator itself. Since we're made in the image of the Creator, they also describe how we're built and how we function. These ten emanations, when fully manifested, come in perfect harmony to create a balanced, unified, perfect, illuminated existence. You might want to think of the Tree of Life as a cosmic instruction manual for life itself. The Sfirot, or spheres, which depict the emanations, are the exploded view of our uh, ethereal parts, arranged in a manner which shows how they balance each other within us. The 22 lines that connect them, corresponding to the 22 Hebrew letters, are the connecting tissue with which we can activate them. You see, none of these emanations are fully activated within us. To do so, we must expand our consciousness. And we expand our consciousness by learning lessons within the incarnations, accumulating knowledge and intellectual understanding, which must be cemented through experience. Now, those of you who have been listening to this podcast from the beginning, you probably noticed that I'm yet to dive deeply into the diagram itself, uh, the diagram that depicts the tree of life. In fact, other than describing it in brief, I talked about it very little. And I'm very unlikely to do it in the future, at least in the context of this podcast. And here's why. The diagram is an attempt to graphically depict specific fundamental concepts about cosmic creation, as well as the inner workings of consciousness itself. But the reality is that if you study the tree of life, you'll realize that there are no two diagrams that are 100% alike. In fact, each Kabbalist has their own opinion in terms of how this diagram should be drawn. I don't think I have two books by two different authors in my personal library that shows the tree of life in the exact same way. Some diagrams have 10 spheres and some 11. Uh, uh, the ones that have 10 do not show a sphere called dot, which is knowing. Some have different lines going to different spheres. However, the real mess begins when you try to figure out which line corresponds to which Hebrew letter or which tarot card in the major arcana. I have a copy of the Book of Formation itself, the primary ancient text describing the Tree of Life, and in the commentary you see different versions in terms of where the letters go on, on the Tree of Life, and in fact, uh, different diagrams as well. Some even flip the masculine and feminine sides of the tree, claiming that it is mirroring you, so you must turn around as if you walk backwards into it, so the left, left side of the tree really represents your right side, and it just goes on and on and on. Now, of course, I can share with you my own ideas around where what goes where. And what I'll be doing then is just contributing yet another version of this diagram to the mix and uh, to the confusion out there. And in the context of this podcast, I don't see this as being necessary. To study the tree of life as a reflection of the human psyche... All we need to know is intellectually understand the concepts which balance us as androgynous beings and experientially then study them within ourselves over time. And that we can do without claiming one version of the tree to be accurately depicted. It is sufficient 
that we understand the basic principles which build the tree and must always be true. And here they are. The tree has three columns. It doesn't matter what diagram you look at, it has three columns. One is going to be masculine, one is feminine. And then there's a central column that shows the balance between these two polarities, which are on the outer sides of the tree. So three columns, one masculine, one feminine, the one in the middle is the balance, the unity between them. Each polarity, masculine or feminine, will show three spheres representing our sexual polarization in three different areas, the mental, the emotional, and the world of action. And our lives are a manifestation of how we balanced, how we're balanced in these three areas. So these are the basic principles which build the tree, regardless of the diagram we'll use. Today, we'll discuss how our androgynous nature reflects itself within us in each and every one of these three realms. Now, let's first recap what it means to be an androgynous being. It means that regardless of our sexual gender, we are an actual expression of an infinitely unique balance between the masculine and the feminine principles. No one is 100% masculine. No one is 100% feminine. It's a range. And in fact, most of us express ourselves in various ways, in both feminine and masculine ways. We see this when we dissect our behavior, the way we move, the way we talk, the sound of our voice, the way we express ourselves artistically, the way we react emotionally. My voice is... Um, is masculine, but I dance, I've been told many times, oh, you dance in a very feminine way. I used to be embarrassed by that, but it's just the way we process our mental stimuli and express it in emotional and physical form. And the way we process the mental stimuli is also either masculine or feminine. The way we reason and use our intellect is one. In fact, our physical gender is just one piece of an entire range of, of characteristics that make us feminine or masculine. Now, the entire creation works upon the concept of the masculine and feminine principles opposing each other. There is no energy in the universe without the dynamic tension between these two opposing principles. Which means that for each area where we show a strong feminine pattern of behavior... There is a hidden masculine behavior and way of expression in the world which we must uncover to fully express ourselves as illuminated and unified beings. Now, this doesn't mean when all said and done, we'll all be gay, flamboyant, or sing like Lady Gaga, all of us men, or that all of us women will know and like to uh, how to you know reconstruct engines or... Uh, you know, behave in a masculine way. We have a personality for a reason. And even when we dissolve the ego personality through the process of uh, psycho-spiritual development, the essence of our personality in this incarnation always remains. But what it does mean that we uncover ways to express the hidden polarity through our existing personality in ways we couldn't do before in the way we think, in the way we feel, and in the way we act in the world. Now let's dive into these three areas briefly and see how the masculine and feminine principles manifest in each one. I find that it's sometimes hard to see ourselves and therefore helpful to have someone else you know in mind while studying these concepts. So as I talk um, about these three realms... You can choose a good friend or family member. You can even choose a public figure like uh, Donald Trump, for example, simply because he represents an extreme character and as such would be easy to detect where he falls on the tree, on the dichotomy between the masculine and the feminine. Also, Donald Trump is very revealing and talkative, and that allows us to see his personality out in the open. Having someone in mind as you listen to this podcast today would help you put a face to this theoretical, heavily intellectual knowledge, giving it very practical and tangible feel. Imagine 
imagine the following conversation between a man and a woman. She says, let's go and have pizza at the farmer's market tonight. And he answers, eh, I'm not feeling it. I already had pizza for lunch. So she says, we never go out and do anything. And he responds, what the hell just happened? Now, if this exchange resonates with you in any way, shape, or form, it's because it's pointing to the fundamental dichotomy which animates us, the polarity between the masculine and the feminine in the way we think. Now, this interaction actually contains all three realms. There's a thought, a feeling, and an action. In this case, something is being said. That's an action. But let's first focus on the mental piece which takes place behind the scenes in this uh, interaction. The first realm to process any kind of energy which is perceived by our consciousness is our mind. For us to have a conscious perception of reality, our mind must first process what we experience. It does it in either a predominantly masculine manner or a predominantly feminine one. If our mind is predominantly masculine, we are logical, linear, focused, analytical, algorithmic, compartmentalized. Such a mind is really great at solving problems. It's using logic to address any challenge and is recruiting reason to save itself from any rough spot, including any emotional trap. If you ask this mind if it wants to go have pizza, it'll tell you if it wants to have pizza, period. It's very literal. It's very direct, like a straight line. This masculine side of our mind is very commonly, but not always, a mental quality demonstrated by men. A predominantly masculine thinker has a hard time reading between the lines. He or she is very literal, very specific, and tends towards accuracy. Engineers, mathematicians, intellectuals are usually people who predominantly think in a masculine manner. That's why most software engineers are men. But again, I do want to mention that this quality is not limited to men. In fact, I know many women that are thinking in this manner. Now, the feminine part of our mind, on the other hand, processes information in an abstract, artistic, holistic, generic, nonlinear, contextual manner. This intuitive, chaotic mind does not know, nor does it want to know, how to reason. It wants to be free of linear constraints. It moves like a wave. It's free of structure. As such, it perceives the messages which are hiding in the words. It knows that when someone asks you to go to the farmer's market and have pizza, what they're really saying is, let's go and spend quality time together. It knows it because it reads between the lines. It senses the energetic vibe of the question and not focusing on its data. It is the feminine side of, of the mind that is commonly, commonly, but not always, a mental quality demonstrated by women. And so the first and top realm, which is the mind, is represented on the tree of life as the top triangle of spheres. One sphere on each side of the tree to represent the masculine and feminine side of our mind, and a central third sphere to represent the unified integrated mind. Now, the integrated mind would potentially answer the above question as follows. Uh, I would love to go to the farmer's, farmer's market with you, but I already had pizza for lunch, so ooh, let's try that Thai cart that they have over there. I heard it's great. This answer will satisfy the emotion which generated the question while still delivering accurate data as to the specifics to ensure that the other person does not hang on false expectations, such as looking forward to have pizza. Now, this balance of the masculine reason and feminine intuition is called on the tree of life as knowing. And here's an analogy that explains why and gives us a general idea as to the difference between the two sides. Imagine a male doctor who has delivered thousands of babies. However, never, obviously, gave birth himself. He's a man. Now, he might know everything that one can know about the process of birthing, but he'll never know what it's like to give birth experientially. Until he does, he'll never know 
he'll never embody a complete knowing of the experience, since knowing means both an intellectual and experiential grasp of the phenomena. Only then true grokking can happen, if to use a term coined by Robert uh, uh, Heinlein in, uh, in the book Stranger in a Strange Land. I don't know if any of you have read it. He coined the, the term grokking. And the same goes the other way. A woman who has given birth several times even, does not necessarily grok the phenomena. For that to happen, an intellectual grasp of the process of birth is required as well. One of the main areas of development that my wife and I have been working on is the area of communication. I'm very linear in my speech. I know what I want to say and I break it down and I follow the thread that is already drawn in my mind until I have communicated all the idea in full. I suspect that the majority of the listeners of this podcast are predominantly masculine or linear in their thinking. Could be many women, but in terms of the way they think, in terms of their mental approach, they are predominantly masculine. This material is very intellectual, it's logical, and will therefore appeal to these kind of people. Now, my wife, on the other hand, is a very abstract conversationalist. She will be talking about one thing and suddenly switching to a different topic without warning, only to come back to the first subject five minutes later and again without warning. And I always viewed it as a flaw, like hummingbird talk, that's how I would call it. She would sometimes switch between three topics within the span of two minutes. How the hell am I supposed to track along? Now, she, on the other hand, always claimed that most of her women friends had no issue tracking along. And sure enough, one day I heard her converse with some of them. And not only they all tracked along, nodding and laughing, but they all did it. They were switching subjects skillfully as if, as if an unseen conductor was supervising the conversation, compensating for the unspoken words with some energetic exchange that was at the time beyond my ability of beyond the ability of my masculine mind to track and follow along. Relationships can be hard, but they also can be enjoyable and powerful in terms of our growth. If we view a relationship as a constant battle to make the other person conform to our point of view, then it will be ongoing hell. If, however, we view our relationship as a tool for self-development, that is, we come together as polarizing mirrors to each other to help the other person evolve and uncover the hidden polarity within, then the relationship can become powerful accelerator towards inner unity and mental, emotional, and even physical development. The more my wife and I converse without judgment or pride, the more my feminine mind is developing, the more I can track along her way of communication and the more I read between the lines. I'm becoming more feminine in the way I think. It doesn't change who I am as a person. It doesn't change the essence of my personality, but it does expand my consciousness. Same goes for her. The more we converse, the more we polarize each other, and the more we are open to each other, the more her masculine mind develops, and she's able to be more literal with me and less annoyed by me lawyering her, as she calls it. Every thought, every mental expression can be dropped into one of these two buckets. It would be either masculine or feminine. The key to mental unity is to learn to embody both. And this is true with every product that mimics a mental process. Take uh, smartphones, for example. The main difference between Android and iOS, Apple's uh, operating system, is that iPhones appeal to people who demonstrate a predominantly feminine line of thinking, visually appealing, functional, simplified, an intuitive interface for an abstract thinker or a kid. Kids love iPads and iPhones but a nightmare for an algorithmic one. Android software, on the other hand, is laid out as a reflection of a database. Hundreds of features, customizable options, all organized by area of technical relevance instead of functionality. Very linear. I can think of a few older people who have been given smartphones by their children or grandchildren and have been struggling with them, not because they are 
uh, more mature and belong to the previous generations, but because they were given the wrong choice of phone to match the way their mind works. An important point worth mentioning is that physically, many call the logical side of the brain the left brain and term the abstract side as the right brain. And I avoid using these terms because of two reasons. The first one is that both ancient wisdom as well as science tells us that there are many abstract, artistic, intuitive functions in the left side of our brain and plenty of analytical, sequential, logical functions on the right side. And the second reason is that in some people, the hemispheres are reversed. Now, for those of you who are interested in this polarity of the mind and want to learn more about it, I recommend watching a 12-minute video called The Divided Brain, narrated by us, the psychiatrist and writer Ian, and it's very hard for me to pronounce his last name, McGill, McGillchrist, McGillchrist, uh, Ian McGillchrist. You'll, you'll figure it out. I included the uh, link in the YouTube link in the episode show notes. Sorry, uh, Ian or Ian for butchering your name. So to summarize, when the tree of life is studied as a reflection of the human expression, the top triangle of spheres, of three spheres, represents the first realm in which we embody this sexual duality, the two ways in which our mind works, the masculine and the feminine. We all embody both and have unique strengths in each side. Some we may not even know about. Uh, some abilities are hidden. Some we need to develop for them to flourish. The tree of life tells us that in one capacity or another, we are all artists, abstractionists, and intuitive, as well as logical, mathematical, and intellectuals capable of advanced linear thinking in one way or another. One of the interesting things about marijuana is that it closes neural pathways that we usually use and open new neural pathways that we rarely use and therefore help expand our ability to think in the uh, mental area that is usually hidden. So if we're predominantly masculine, it helps us to think in a feminine manner, in an abstract manner. If we are predominantly feminine, it helps us to think in a uh, masculine manner. My wife and I, in fact, have done uh, several therapy sessions between us um, smoking, uh, smoking pot and talking to each other because it allowed me to understand her more and um, allowed her to understand the logic behind the things that I was saying. There were many aha moments, many like, oh, that's why, type of thing. And then the next day, once the influence of the marijuana has passed, um, there was a, the aha moment actually stays. That is, there was an understanding, that kind of knowing um, that kind of sunk in that stayed with us and allowed us to, um, to understand each other better. about the androgynous way with which our mind processes information. And the second realm in which our androgynous nature manifests within us is the realm of emotions. Once we had a thought, we have some kind of an emotional response to that thought. And just like in the mental realm, the response can be either masculine or feminine. And it's represented on the tree of life as the second triangle and in our body, in the heart. Kabbalah tells us that there are only two mother emotions from which all other are derived, and they are love and fear. 
Now, it's not the love and fear that we know. Instead, they point to an archetypal, holistic umbrella for various emotional patterns which manifest in us. Because we have a strong association with these words, with these terms, things can get quite confusing when we start talk about actual feelings. And so I prefer to rename these two mother emotions as expansion and contraction. Every mental awareness which manifests in our minds is causing an emotional response of either expansion, which is expressed outwards and is masculine, or contraction, which is expressed inward and is feminine. Our entire emotional expression is a synthesis between these two masculine and feminine emotional emanations represented by the middle sphere. Let's break it down a little bit more. This is the realm where things can get a bit tricky since emotions are subjective. It's a bit hard to draw a line in the sand between the masculine and the feminine. And the reason is that most emotions can be expressed both as expansive and contractive. Take anger, for example. We can blow up and show rage, which is very expansive and masculine in nature. But we can also be seething from within, which is a contracting emotion. Just like in the mental realm, it would serve us well to distinguish between the cosmic emanations in their pure divine form and the way they manifest in our personality, in our ego personality, which is, uh, how shall we say, a little less perfect. The pure emanation representing the masculine emotional response can be thought of as the unconditional love of the Father. It's expansive, it's giving, showering with bliss and love. It's all compassionate, caring, affectionate, tender, caressing. It's gentle, it's nurturing, sustaining, supportive, enhancing, developing fostering, nourishing, rewarding. It's feeding us, enriching. This is the loving father who wants to shower its children with all that the universe can offer. When we embody it, we are loving, we're compassionate and warm towards others. However, when we don't balance it by its feminine contractive counterpart, to which we'll get in a minute or two, it manifests in various aspects of our ego personality, which can cause us suffering. When we are imbalanced and overly emotionally expansive, we see the suffering of the world around us and become overwhelmed by it. We want all people to be happy, and yet there's so much suffering. We love others unconditionally, and it breaks our heart to see them struggle. We then experience various unpleasant emotions in an expansive manner. And here are some examples. Moping, melancholia, sorrow, pitifulness, mournfulness, devastation, yearning, wretchedness, expressive anger and rage, terror, uh, woefulness, shameful, uh, shamefulness, playing the victim. Dramatic emotional breakdowns of all kinds will fall under this category. Think of those who overextend themselves emotionally only to become resentful or those who become self-righteous to the point that they shame everyone who is not dedicating their life to help starving kids in Africa or is unable or uninterested to express their feelings. Now, on the other side of the equation, we have the pure emanation representing the feminine emotional response. And in Hebrew, this sphere is called gvoa, which means braveness or courage. And this is because it takes courage to withhold our love for the greater good, and because there is no courage without fear. We must be afraid of something in order to have courage. Now, this emanation can be thought of as the lion-hearted, protective conduct of the archetypal mother. It is a contractive emanation in nature, a contractive emotion in nature. It's protective and restrictive to ensure survival, to ensure well-being, to ensure emotional and physical health. It's the part of us which forbids our kids to have chocolate for breakfast. 
It's shielding, it's covering, it's preventative, it's careful, it's conserving, it's preserving, heroic, courageous, bold, enforcing, regulating, governing, stable. Think of an educator, a mother protecting her children, or even a warrior. It's the divine emanation which allows the Creator to see us suffering and yet not get involved itself, allowing us as humanity to evolve and learn our own lesson on our own. It is Siddhartha, for those of you who have read the book, who allowed his son to go and make the same mistakes he did, since he knew that as a father he must allow his son to learn his own lessons and to live his own life. And that takes a lot of courage. Now, when imbalanced, this emanation manifests in our personality as harsh, as defensive, conservative. We overly contract, and so we become repressive, inhibiting, prohibiting, suppressive, rigid. We become harsh, fearful, timid, cowardly, hateful, demeaning, humiliating, insulting, derogatory, uh, paternalistic, patronizing, depressed, repressed, curbed, quelled, low-spirited, an overprotecting parent, a harsh teacher, or a melancholic teenager are a good example. To the extreme, we can find the heart of dictators and ruthless criminals or those who shut themselves off to the world completely without the ability to communicate and relate to anyone. Notice that while this sphere is called gwa, which means courage, it has qualities of fear when manifested in the human personality or where overextended. And think of it this way. There is no courage without fear. For us to be courageous, we must have fear to conquer, to overcome. And so aggression many times comes out of fear. Fear is almost always contractive. It causes us to shrink down and to freeze. Now, we can either be fearful or we can have courage and overcome the fear. But the contraction is still there. Now, the balanced emanation between the two, between these two emanations, the masculine and the feminine in this emotional realm, is the heart, which expresses unconditional love, yet also know when to withhold it. This balanced heart is fearless, yet careful, tender, yet fierce, fostering, yet regulating. It's rewarding, yet preserving. In Kabbalah, it's called, in Hebrew, it's called tiferet, which means beauty. It is the heart that always emanates beauty, not just because it's uh, loving and uh, gushing with love, but also because you can see that it's also the heart of a lion. It's impossible not to love and adore. Tiferet is the central sphere on the tree of life. It represents the awakened, transformed heart of the enlightened man. When balanced, it's the heart of the archetypal father and divine mother in one, an androgynous beating heart which is all capable and burns with fierce love. Now to summarize... Our emotional nature is the second realms in which our androgyny is reflected. We're all skewed to one side or another, some more than others. By studying the tree of life and paying attention to our emotions, we can start seeing the pattern and notice where we need to balance ourselves. Do we express love towards others easily? Do we laugh and enjoy life? Do we love and care for ourselves? Are we predominantly angry? In what way? Is it very expressive or kind of like inward? Are we predominantly sad? Are we often afraid? Are we usually contracting in our emotions or expanding? Know thyself.
conscious awareness has generated a mental perception, which was either masculine, logical, or feminine, abstract. We then experienced the seed of emotion, which in turn was also either masculine, expansion, or feminine, contraction. The last realm in which we demonstrate our androgynous nature is the, tr the third triangle in the tree of life, the third and bottom one. It is the seed of action. Many Kabbalist scholars will deem this triangle in the realm of emotion because it's still not quite action itself. So they really see the second and third triangle as emotions. And that's why I like to call it the seed of action because to me it's not quite emotion anymore. The emotion took place. This is a sexual polarity which is processing the thought and then the emotion that we just experienced and causing us to choose a course of action. This action uh, might, might end up being speech, something we say, or an actual physical action such as smiling, sitting down to write a poem, or even hitting someone, or maybe doing nothing. In any case, just like the mental and emotional triangles, it's a reflection of a sexual polarity, a sexual duality between two opposing principles, a masculine, which stands for direct action, and an outward expression, and a feminine one, which stands for no action and receptivity. So when it comes to the seat of action, the masculine side is choosing to give energy and act. Anytime we decide to act, we're being direct. The decision to act in itself is focused. We're doing something specific which can be described. We're going out for a movie. We're jumping out of an airplane. We are cooking soup. That is the masculine principle of action or the seed of action, the decision to act, the choice that was made. We could have stayed home. We could have not signed up for skydiving or we could have ordered food delivery, but we chose to act in a particular way. We applied our will, which is the masculine essence, towards a desired result. We cannot achieve anything in the world without action. To win, we must play the game. We must choose a course of action. It's a direct, focused, specific activity. Continuous action will always yield results. Whether the results will be what we expected and intended, that's a whole different story, but there will be some results. Without action, we are guaranteed to stay where we are. Even a thousand-mile walk starts with one step, and the only way to complete the walk is always to tick the next step, action. Now, action by nature is focused. And as we said, and it's always outward. We're spending energy. We're giving it out with a particular intention in mind. This is the idea behind the masculine principle. Like in electricity, it is the one carrying the charge, the one providing the current, the energy. And in the Zohar, the masculine principle is called netzach, which means victory or to win. It's triumphant, it's undefeated, it's invincible, it's decisive, it's successful, it's unstoppable, it's concentrated, it's ever-present, very selective, very devoted, dedicated. It's the, it is the emanation of the divine which cannot fail. It always prevails and will always end up victorious by achieving its goal. And you cannot achieve your goal without action. You must put energy outward to create a desired result. When over-applied, Netzach will manifest in our ego personality as controlling, egocentric, aggressive, uh, narcissist, uh, selfish, uh, vociferous, uh, ravaging, oppressive, uh, disregarding, ungrateful, ungr ungraceful, careless, rash, reactive, reckless, obnoxious, indiscriminate, over-fixated. We are determined to win no matter what, and we'll do whatever it takes, even if it means running over others. Very masculine energy, no doubt. The receiving end of this masculine energy will always be the feminine principle of this uh, third and bottom triangle on the tree of life, which is receptive. 
When it comes to the seat of action, the feminine side is choosing to receive energy, not to give it out. That is, it is choosing inaction. We choose not to accept the offer on the house and wait until the market gets better. We choose to write nothing in response to a scathing email we just got from someone. We choose to drop out of the marathon and wait for next year until our leg is fully healed. When applied in balance, it is very powerful. Sometimes inaction is the best course of action, so to speak. However, often it requires patience in overcoming our ego as well as controlling our desire. And when we're full of anxiety as to the outcome of a particular scenario, inaction requires courage and patience and can drive us mad. When our pride is the target of the masculine energy, it takes grace to do nothing. And in the Zohar, this emanation is called Hod, which means elegant, gracefulness, uh, somewhat with a majestic quality to it. It's a very feminine and receptive quality. In the cosmic, divine manifestation of this emanation, we are open, we're vast, accepting, receiving, we're gracious, we're classy, we're refined, we're very gentle, we're elegant, we're loose, we're exposed, we're free, we're unrestricted, we're undefended, we're vulnerable, or maybe we're delicate, we're generous, we're gentle, we're benevolent. Very feminine qualities indeed. And just like the feminine emotion above it on the tree of life, it is expansive in nature, which is the feminine principle. By choosing no action, we keep the option of choosing any action we want. Now, when this particular emanation is over-applied in uh, our ego, it reflects in our ego personality as unresolved, indecisive, uh, maybe lingering, unclear, unfocused, uninspired, uh, hesitant, stagnant. Um, we seem sluggish. We are frozen, timid, lifeless, lethargic, stumbling, lazy, skulky, dormant. We're aloof. We're anemic, even paralyzed in our action. We're submissive. The balanced sphere in the center of the line of the tree, which balances these two spheres, is called yesod, which means foundation. It's considered to be the foundation of all action after processed by the mental and emotional body. So it's essentially the foundation of our kingdom, of our lives. It's the sexual manifestation of our entire set of behavior pattern. Here you will find the various sexual quality of our infinitely unique nature, which is a result of how the energy was balanced between our masculine and feminine principle in all three realms. And it causes to us to operate in a particular way in the world. Yes, so it is the reason that we dress how we dress. It's the reason that we walk how we walk. It's the reason that the tone of our voice is the tone of our voice. It's uh, causing us to speak in a particular way. It's uh, animating our hand movement, our character, our sexual preferences. Yes, so it also stands for our physical sexuality. And if you look at the tree of life, it's located exactly where the uh, genitalia is. Yesod is our ego personality. Divine energy was filtered through all the channels, all most of the lines on the tree of life to create this infinitely unique representation of our existence in the world, going through the uh, mental, then through the emotional, then through the seat of action to manifest in that particular sphere. From the sphere of foundation, Yesod, our world sprouts. It's the distilled, processed, refined seed of energy that we put out to the world. It's our speech, which in spiritual methodology is the way we co-create. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. We speak our reality into existence. Eastern spirituality says the same thing. Here's a quote by Lao Tzu. Watch your thoughts, for they become words. Watch your words, for they become actions. Watch your actions, for they become habits. Watch your habits, for they become character. And watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. 
and Kabbalah. This fear, Yesod, is called is also called Sadiq. That's another name for it. And that means saint, a holy man. And this is because this fear is the measure by which we can see what kind of person we are. When our sexual polarities are balanced, we embody the divine essence of all the emanations. In our mind, in the mental realm, we can think both logically and have immense intellectual power while at the same time think abstractly and be artistic, intuitive, and creative. We don't just think, we know. In the emotional realm, in our heart, we are both loving and fierce, both brave and vulnerable, both generous as well as capable of withholding our energy for the greater good. We shine our light in any situation. Our heart is always open. If we have to, Even if we have to fight, like Prince Arjuna, who fought his beloved cousin in the Bhagavad Gita, the uh, ancient Hindu text, we embody beauty. When it comes to our actions, we are invincible while being graceful, focused while loose, devoted while unrestricted, unstoppable while gentle. The expression of this balance, existence, is the holy man or woman. And from Yasod, our reality comes to life. We are then an illuminated being. The light passes through us, is unabstracted. This is where we manifest the best qualities in each one of the emanations. And so this third realm, the realm of action, the seat of action, is the third realm and the bottom triangle in the tree of life in which our androgynous nature represents itself. And so we have the mental, the emotional, and the seat of action as the three realms in which we constantly choose between our feminine and masculine polarity, giving us a total of nine spheres. The tenth sphere is our lives, our kingdom. And you can see on the diagram of the tree of life that is below Yesod, it emanates from all other nine spheres. Our work as spiritual journeyers is to balance these spheres in terms of their sexual polarization consistently and methodically. question which comes to mind is, how does this knowledge help us? It's nice to know, but we are who we are. However, the inherent androgynous nature of our being has tremendous implications on how we can actively investigate and understand our own personality and behavior patterns if we're interested in expanding our consciousness. In other words, understanding, intellectual understanding, is a step on the way to experiential change, which then results in knowing, results in consciousness expansion. Understanding our androgynous nature can help us eliminate our suffering, which is done by dissolving our ego personality, which, as we mentioned throughout this podcast today, manifests all these emotions that are unpleasant, all these behavior patterns in the seat of action that are undesirable, all these thought patterns that are um, skewed to one side of, of the uh, or the other, uh, preventing us from understanding other people or from expressing ourselves in the world freely. In other words, we're dissolving the skewed polarization of the masculine or feminine imbalance between us in all three realms and learning to balance ourselves in areas where we're skewed to one side or another. I'll introduce many techniques down the line to show how this can be done. Very specific, tangible, action-oriented techniques. I'll often refer back to this concept of androgyny and the range of our sexual expression because it is the key by which these techniques operate. Once this fundamental understanding is present in us, we can develop it to understand our natures as beings. We can investigate our thoughts, our emotions, and behavior to determine the cause for the way we conduct in the world. Our sense of self-worth, for example. 
our ability to show up or not, our fears, our anger, our destructive behaviors, our addictions. Since we're all made in the same image, all these distortions from our inner unity go back to a sexual imbalance on the tree of life. I'll discuss many of these common imbalances as well as powerful techniques and methods with which we can actively change them. Another area that the Tree of Life proved to be very powerful in is relationships, especially romantic one, because in romantic relationship, we always pair with our polarizing side of the tree. We fall in love with the hidden polarity within us. So in fact, with the Tree of Life, relationships becomes accelerator for self-development. In essence, that's what relationships are. All attraction and repulsion in our interactions with others goes back to the sexual polarization of our cosmic template. We're repelled by the energy which matches our own and are attracted to the polarized energy. And so every interaction as a part of our relationship can be examined with the tree of life to understand the nature of the dynamics. It gives us a methodology to deal with all relationships and relationship dynamics. Why do we get triggered? How to respond when we get triggered? And ultimately, how to avoid getting triggered? It explains to us why we are attracted to some and not to others. It shows us how everyone mirrors our own inner nature, how we are walking in a world full of mirrors into our own psyche. The better we get at detecting the patterns and how they fit on this cosmic template, which is the tree of life, the better we become at handling relationships, conducting ourselves in the world, achieving what we want and becoming all we can be. I have a reflection for you today. I invite you to think about your own behavioral patterns. Is your mind, the way you mentally process information, is it mostly masculine, that is, linear and logical, or is it mostly feminine, that is, abstract and intuitive? In what areas do you use your non-dominant side of your mind? And when it comes to your emotional patterns, are you mostly expansive or contracted? Are you quick to anger with a short fuse or quick to hag and shower love on others? Are you suffering from anxiety? What are the emotional patterns that are strongly present in you? And when it comes to your inclination towards action, are you more reserved and hesitant, graceful and quiet, or are you more passionate, go-getter, who would do anything to achieve the goal? This concludes the sixth episode of Kabbalistic Mystic. I want to remind you that iTunes reviews are very important as they can help sustain the show. I also want to remind you that you can submit any question to be answered on the show via the website at www.kabbalisticmystic.com. That's K and double B. I thank you for listening today. Today we heard music by Bramji. I am Ovadia Batat from Spokane, Washington, wishing you love in every moment. Bye.